start recording. Everything is recording. Screen is good. Okay, there we go. All right, so this is the A star algorithm homework assignment. Um, you just basically have to follow the A star algorithm. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing that I did with Dijkstra's algorithm today, which is you know basically you know looking at this, trace through the algorithm, and then we'll go back to the final exam. Okay. All right. So um, the spreadsheet is the same as last time. So we just I just have to go look for that spreadsheet. Um, yeah, so I just need to go to drive, or I can use one of these tabs here and go all the way back to my drive. Go to this class. And I'm going to use exactly the same document as last time. Um, so that would be 2024-0429. Okay, I'm just going to open a new tab for this homework assignment. So sheet two is the trace that I did, you know, to illustrate how to work with the A star algorithm. So it has, for the most part, the right format already. Um, in terms of the columns, I think it's exactly the same ones that we need. So I'm going to do a right click and then just duplicate it. And then I'll just you know, mark this one as your know, A star homework, okay? And then we then in, and then I have to switch back to the homework assignment, and then just copy a little bit of the information on right here, um, because the distances to the the distances of the edges and also the heuristic function is pretty much the only thing I need, um, because the D function also tells us what edges we have. In the graph, so that means you know all I need is the d and the h. So I'm gonna do a little, the same trick that I did last time. Okay, you know, basically just take a screenshot of just this portion, open it up in its own viewer, and then make this one always on top. Then I can switch back to the spreadsheet, and then we can talk about the solution. All right, so put this one out of the way. So it looks like we have A, B, C, X as the vertices. So there are only four vertices and not even five. Yep. I am recording. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So that means you know, this is an easier one. So we just got A, B, C, X, which is our destination. There's no vertex E anymore. So once again, A, B, C, X, no E. A, B, C, X, there's no E. And I can even make this a little bit easier to read. Get rid of all the columns that are empty. So get rid of all these. Right click. Um, let's see, delete selected columns. There we go. All right. So for the rest, I am going to delete this portion here. Okay. And then the initialization, I also have to be careful because I need to know which one is our starting point. So I believe vertex A is still the starting point, but I am going to double check and make sure. So here we go. The start vertex is vertex A and the destination is vertex X. Okay, so the assumption that I was making earlier was actually valid. So now we go back here and now we can just go ahead and work with this. <clears throat> so the initialization is about the same, except for the f value. In this case, the f value of a is a zero, because the heuristic function of from a to x is a zero. Okay, so that's the pretty much the only thing we have to uh, modify from the original one. Um, we still have to put vertex a in the set O because it is the starting point. It is This is the start vertex. So for the most part, okay, you guys can do exactly the same thing. You don't have to remove the column that is not in use. All you have to do is to kind of blank out that column, and that's fine too. Do we have any questions about the initialization part of the A star algorithm? Okay, no questions? All right. So now we go into the while loop, okay? So it is helpful if you can view the algorithm on your side or if you have it kind of memorized, you know, that works too. So the first thing we have to do is to go to the while loop. The condition of the while loop 
is to ask, is at least one of the elements of the set O having an F value that is less than the G value of the destination? The G value of the destination is infinity. The F value of the only vertex in O has a value of zero. Zero is less than infinity is true. Okay, so we are good. That means that you know, we cannot exit the loop. We have to go for the first iteration. So choosing the vertex for variable C is easy because we only have one single vertex. So that's, that means you know, I don't really have to choose. And then we take it out of the set O. And now we have to look at all the outgoing neighbors of vertex A. In other words, we're looking at all the vertex, we're looking at all the edges that says you know, A something. And we got quite a few. Uh, we have AX, we have AB, we have AC, okay? So these, there are three options here. So if I were you, I would kind of do it like this, okay? Just to remind myself, myself that there are three um, outgoing neighbors of vertex A, so this way I don't forget later. For each one, I had to evaluate and initialize local variable T. T is the, um, <clears throat> the G value of a in this case, plus the distance of the edge of A to X you know, in this particular case. So you can see that you know, A, X has a distance of 10. So zero plus 10 is 10. So now we put the 10 here. And now we compare this 10 to the um, G value of the destination. The G value of the destination is an infinity. So 10 is not a small number in the grand, in this particular graph, but it is still less than infinity. So we have a bunch of stuff to update. So without any particular you know, order, the first one I'm going to order, uh, the first one I'm going to change is um, this one here. And because the G value, I mean, excuse me, the heuristic value of X to X is always zero. So that means the F value of X is just going to be 10 plus zero, which is also just 10. And then here, I have to remember, in order to get from vertex A to vertex X, which is our destination, um, the previous of X is going to be vertex A. And of, after all of this stuff here, we have to add vertex X into the set O. So now the, the set O has a single element again, which is vertex X. Do we have any questions about these particular steps? Okay. And the next two, yeah, go ahead. It would not matter. Yeah. So you know, within you know the same you know the for each loop, the ordering of the for each loop is up to you. It's kind of arbitrary. As long as you cover the three outgoing neighbors, it's fine. You know, it doesn't matter what order you do it. All right. So we work with uh, vertex B. So now we have to compute T. So once again, you know, the T value is f of a plus the distance from A to B in this case. F of A is a zero, excuse me, G of A is a zero. So did I say F of A? I meant G of A, okay? So G of A is a zero, zero plus the distance from A to B, okay, is a three. So now we have a, we have a three here. Uh, three is less than infinity, so we have stuff to do. So now we put the three over here, and then this one depends on the heuristic from B to X. And from B to X, the heuristic value is a four. So three plus four is a seven. And in order to get to vertex B, uh, the best path I have right now is coming from vertex A. And also, you know, we have to add vertex B to the set. So the set now has vertex X as well as vertex B at this point. So do we have any questions about this particular step? Nope. Okay. All right. Very good. So now we move on to vertex C, which is kind of about the same thing. Uh, G of A is a zero. The distance from A to C is a five. So zero plus five is a five. And so, okay, let me just ask one thing. What is five representing? What is variable T representing? in terms of the meaning of the algorithm. I, I describe how it is computed, but what is the meaning of that particular value? Yeah, go ahead. D? 
the it's from the starting point through vertex A to C. It is the length of A path, not necessarily the shortest, but it is the length of A path from the starting point through vertex A to vertex C in this case. Okay, so it is important that in this case, yes, you know, we are looking at you know the variable C has vertex A in it, but that's just because you know, we are at the beginning of this entire thing. So basically, whatever vertex is in variable C is a via, VIA, or through your vertex. We're going through that particular vertex to, in this case, vertex C, and the length of that particular path is a five. So that's important because you know, once we understand what T is really representing, then we understand the algorithm, not just mechanically what we're supposed to do, but why it works. Because we're comparing this five to the G of C, and G of C, G of C is an infinity right now. So now we are basically recognizing that the shortest known path has a length of infinity, which is kind of odd, right? You know, but that all that means is we haven't found a path yet. And now we have found a path with a length of five. So I think it's an improvement, right? So that is why, you know, that triggers the logic of saying, okay, let's go and do a bunch of updates because by definition, G of C is the length of the shortest known path from the start vertex through vertex A of, uh, to vertex C. Okay, this doesn't care about which through vertex. So that's why we have to update this one. Now, the F value of C is an estimate. Okay, it is basically estimating if I go from the start vertex through vertex C to the destination, which is vertex X, um, what is the best estimate of that length, of the length of that path? So in this case, I have to put, I have, I have to look up G of C, which is a five, and then I have to add the heuristic value between C and X, which is a zero. So five plus zero is a five. So this particular five here is basically saying, it's, it's related to this five, but the meanings are different. This five is basically saying, if I start from vertex A, which is my starting point, go through vertex C, okay, and what exact path you know, to go from the starting point to vertex C, I don't really know, nor do I care. And then from vertex C all the way to the destination, which is vertex X, the estimate of that length, of the length of that path, the best I can do is a five. Okay, so it's an estimate, okay? The F value is an estimate, or at least you know, one part of it is an estimate. And the PREV is so that I can track my way back to you know, where I need, what is the previous vertex, okay? You know, how it is connected back to the starting point. So now I have to add vertex C into the set as well, because you know, the, whenever the G value of a vertex is changed, you have to put it into the set O because it may become a promising place to start in the next iteration of the while loop. Okay, so now we're back to the while loop. You know, the, for each loop, you know, of the first iteration of the while loop, evaluates the edges A X, A B, A C, and now we are all done. So we're back to the while loop, and the while loop says, can I find at least one of the vertices in O? such that the F value of that vertex is less than the G value of the destination. This time, the G value of the destination is a 10. It is not infinity anymore. So I cannot just take things for granted and say, oh yeah, you know, let's go ahead and do something. So now we have to look at the actual F value of X, B, and C, and see at least, see whether at least one of them has an F value that is less than 10. The F value of X is a 10. Now you guys would go like, yeah, obviously, because it's the destination. But the algorithm doesn't care. The algorithm simply says, you know, evaluate all of the vertices in O and find out do we have at least one of them being having an F value that is less than 10. So this one is root out. Let's try B. Uh, that's a three. So that means I can go into the loop already. I don't even have to take a look at the F value of C because the quantifier in the condition of the while loop is existential. It is not a universal quantifier. Does that make sense? 
Okay. All right. So once we get into the while loop, the very first thing we need to do is to say out of the three elements in O, pick one to quote unquote expand. Okay. And this is where the algorithm, you know, this is why the algorithm is called a greedy algorithm. It basically finds the most optimistic uh, option out of all the options available. In other words, it will look at vertices B, uh, X, B, and C, and see which one has the lowest F value. Because you know, that tells us, hmm, this looks the most promising, okay? Because it's an estimate of the actual length of the shortest path from the starting point through that particular vertex to the destination. So we look at all the options that we have. X has an F value of 10, B has an F value of seven, C has an F value of five, C looks the most promising. So that's why we choose vertex C in this case. And then once we choose something out of the set, we remove it from the set. And now we have to look at all the outgoing neighbors of vertex C, okay? In other words, we look at all the edges of C something. So we see that there's a CX, you know, which is a three, and that seems to be the only outgoing edge from vertex C, okay, which is fine. So the first thing we have to do is to evaluate T. So in this particular case, you know, T is the G value of C, which is a five, plus the distance of the edge from C to X, which is a three. Five plus three is an eight, okay? And now we have to look at this eight and then compare this eight which is the length of a path. This is the length of an actual path from the starting point through vertex C to vertex X. And we have to compare that to the length of the current shortest path from the starting point to vertex X. Now, whether vertex X is the destination really does not matter. The algorithm does not care about that. So we compare the eight to the 10, eight is less than 10. So that means we have just found a shorter path from the starting point to um, vertex X in this case, which so happens to be the destination. So now we have to do a bunch of updates again. Okay, this is eight. This is going to be eight plus zero because the heuristic of going from X to X is a zero. <clears throat> and then we also have to update this one and say, oh, in order to go to vertex X, don't come from vertex A. Instead, come from vertex C, okay? And then over here, we also have to add vertex X to the set, but since all, it's already in the set O, it would appear that we do not, we are not changing the set O at all. Are we good with all of this stuff here? Okay, all right. So now we are, we're done with the for each loop because there's only one vertex coming out of vertex C, which is from C to X. So now we are out of the, uh, for each loop, which is the last statement of the while loop. We go all the way back to the original, to the while loop, and then we ask that question again. Out of the two elements of O, is at least one of these vertices having an F value that is less than the G value of X? But the G value of X has changed to an eight. So we have to be careful. Yes? You should rewrite it. I'm not gonna take any points off if you leave it blank, because leaving it blank means you're not touching it. But having the same value here means you touched it. It just so happens that after the evaluation, it is the same value. So technically speaking, you know, a blank versus the same value in the cell are mean different things. Because a blank means, you know, um, I'm not even touching it. But, you know, the same value means I'm touching it. It just so happens to be the same thing. But I'm not gonna take points off for this assignment. Yep. Yes, I mean, I might have misspoke, <laughs> misspoken. So it is the F value of X and the F value of B compared to the G value of X. You're correct. So now we look at the F value of X that is always going to be the same as the G value of X because X is the destination. But we perform the operation here without actually putting any special consideration because X is a destination. We still evaluate the same way. And then we look at F of B, which is a seven. Oh, okay, seven is less than eight. So that means 
um, we have we have hope, okay, that we might find a shorter path. So that means we're starting another iteration of the while loop at this point, and this time we are choosing uh, vertex B. So that results in O, you know, being just having X. And then we have to look at all the outgoing edges of B at this point. So when you look at the um, cost to your function or the distance function here, B has two outgoing edges, one going to C and one going to X. So that's what we're going to do, okay, C and X. The ordering is not important, okay? So I like to kind of put both down here to remind myself that there are two outgoing edges, so don't miss one of them. So now we look at BC first. So we have to evaluate T, which is G of B, which is a three, plus the distance from B to C, which is a one. So three plus one is a four, okay? So we have the four as T. And what you need to compare is this four, which is representing the length of a path to vertex C, to G of C, which is representing the length of the shortest known path at this point. Four is less than five, right? So that means I have just found a shorter path from the start vertex to vertex C in this case. So that triggers a bunch of updates. So now I have to update this one from five to four. And then we have to update this one um, so it is, I think it is also five to four because this particular value is the G of C plus the heuristic from C to the destination, which is zero. So this one is also four. And then we have to update um, pref of C so that we can say, okay, don't come from vertex A. The shortest path, you know, uh, needs to come from vertex B instead. So that needs to be updated. And now we have to add vertex C back into the set O. So now it has X and C in the set. Is that part okay? So this is something that we don't see. Hmm. Okay, let me try to remember. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll refrain from drawing that conclusion because I'm not sure that I'm right. So I'm, I'll not draw the conclusion. All right, so now we evaluate BX, so same thing. We have to look at the G value of B, which is three, plus the distance from C, B to X, which is a five. So we are looking at three plus five, which is an eight, put it here. And then we ask, did we find, just find a shorter path from the start vertex to vertex X? The answer is nope, because it is already an eight here. So even though this route is has the same value, which is also kind of the, shortest known up to this point is not shorter, okay? So that means we don't update anything in this case. Are we good so far? Yes? Are you sure that's eight? Uh, uh, let me double check. <laughs> G of B, okay, is a three, yeah. and then three plus the, uh, BX has a distance of five, so we're adding that five to three, which is an eight. So. Oh, oh, sorry. No, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. Oh, okay. I was, I was looking uh, farther. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So I think this eight is correct. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. All right. That's okay. So now we have the for each loop all done. And then we go all the way back to the beginning of the while loop. The while loop look at, you know, looks at the set O. And once again, we have the same question. Um, does at least one of the vertices in O does it have a F value that is less than the G value of the destination? So once again, we just go for the evaluation. Um, currently, the G value of X is eight, okay? That's the G value of the destination. The F value of X is also an eight, so X does not meet the criterion that I just spoke of. But vertex C does, okay? Because vertex C, which is also an element of O, currently has an F value of four. Four is less than eight, so we have another, at least one more iteration to go. So this time we are choosing C again from the set O, and then the set O now only you know, goes back to only having element X or vertex X. And now we have to reevaluate all the outgoing edges of C. So once again, you go like, oh, but we have been here before. 
Okay, it has one outgoing edge to x. So is it going to change anything? The answer is yes, because the g value of um, c has changed. Okay, so now we reevaluate and find out, okay, what is t? t is the g value of c, which is a 4 this time, plus the distance from c to x, which is a 3. Now we get the 7 that you mentioned. <laughs> so now we get the 7. And then we compare the 7 to the g value of x, you know, of the n, you know, as a variable. So that is 8. 7 is less than 8 is true. So now we got yeah, some updates to do. So we update, you know, the g value of x to be 7. The f value is also updated to 7 because the h, the heuristic value from x to x is a 0. And then we also have to update the prev because in order to get to vertex x, the best route is to go through vertex c. And then once we are done here, we go back here. So technically speaking, you know, we are adding the element x back into the set O, but since it already has it, so it doesn't reflect that there's any actual change. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yep. You mean the this column here? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the it doesn't really change the value that's already here, but technically, you know, we're still going through the algorithm. So if you don't put anything here, I'm not going to take any points off. But I put something here because the, the, there's a distinction distinction between an empty cell versus a cell that still has the same value as what it had last time. Because this basically reflects that yes, we updated but it's the same value that we had already in that particular column. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. So that concludes the for each loop in this while loop. And that brings us all the way back to the while condition again. So the while condition looks at the only element in O and it asks the same question. Can we find at least one element in O so that its f value is less than the f the g value of the destination and this time the answer is no because the only element here is quote unquote the destination the f value of x is a 7 but the g value of the destination is a 7 as well 7 is less than 7 it's false and this is the only thing we have in the set o so that means now we get out of the loop so we get out of the loop when O is still non-empty. Now the question is, some, of pe some people may have this observation because you know, the example that I used in class last week, I think, you know, with uh, the A star algorithm also ended with only the destination in the set O. So the question is, is that the only case when we exit the loop in A star algorithm? The answer is no, okay? It can contain additional elements if things do not work out. In fact, if the heuristic function is quote unquote well informed, which means it reflects the actual distance instead of just being a gross underestimate of the actual distance, then you might end up with a bunch of elements here because the heuristic is so good, so informed that it was able to, you were able to find the shortest path like really quickly and all the alternatives are known to be bad because the heuristic is doing such a good job of estimating, in quotes, you know, the actual distance between a vertex and the destination. So you know, it is not always the case that you end up with O only containing the destination. It might contain additional vertices as well. The more in well-informed the heuristic function, the more elements you tend to see remaining in the set O when the algorithm exits. Does that make sense? Okay, all right, cool. So that's it for the homework assignment, okay? You know, we do not remove X from O. You know, this is the conclusion, this is it, we're done. Question? Yep, go ahead. Uh, did you want us to write the actual two tuple uh, G, uh, G sub S and X for our answer? So like the two tuple of the sets of the vertices and the edges that go to the destination? You don't have to. You know, did, did I ask for that I don't know. in the I, question? I just wrote it right. Okay, yeah, you don't have to do it. But 
I think is a good question is where is the shortest path, right? Because you know, this algorithm is supposed to find the shortest path. How do I find the actual shortest path? So the trick to do that is to start with a destination when you look up the pref you know, um, function. So in order to get to X, we have to get, we have to go from C and then you track it back to C and you, you say, it says, you know, in order to get to uh, C, it, you should you know, start with, you should come from B. And then over here, it says, you know, in order to get to B, you have to come from A. And because A is the starting point, so it has no pref, you know, so that completes the whole path. In other words, A, B, C, X is indeed the shortest path in this case. Yes, because you know, because of the way the algorithm works, um, the destination, the destination has to be put into O at least once. Does that make sense? And it can never leave because it will never, it will never have a f value that is less than the g value to begin with. So it won't even be a candidate because we we can only select. Okay, if none of the vertices in O has its F value being less than the G value of the destination, we are done with the entire algorithm, right? So that means you know, once the destination vertex is in O, it can never be removed. That was, that's, a, that's a very correct observation. All right. Any additional questions or observations? So you can ask, you can, you can tell me about an observation and turn it into a question like, okay, it seems like you know, this is the pattern. Is it the case? Is it always the case? Those are very good questions to ask. Now you don't have to ask, ask, you know, like in class, but if you have an observation in your mind, you can you know, ask me over email or come to my office hour and you know, I can you know, answer those questions too. All right. So you can see that in this particular case, we can re-explore vertices and we can also re-explore edges. See how CX is appearing twice here. So that means the complexity of the A star algorithm can potentially be worse than the time complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm, which does not seem to make sense. Because the A star algorithm was invented after Dijkstra's algorithm. So why do you think <laughs> the A star algorithm may actually have a time complexity that is worse than the Dijkstra's algorithm? What makes that happen? Yeah. Yeah, back to O. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me ask a follow-up question. How did that happen in this particular case? Well, uh, when we uh, when we took the other set mm -hmm. to explore the outgoing edges from C, mm -hmm. um, it had C as an out, like it has an outgoing edge towards C. That means there's a chance. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to add it back into O and then re-explore it to C. Okay, is there is this going to result in a shorter path? Mm -hmm. But it also has to do with the prioritization of which uh, element we extract out of O first, mm -hmm. and that has to do with the heuristic function. In this case, I specifically gave the algorithm a misleading heuristic. I was trying my best to fool the algorithm. So it has to do more work than it normally has to. So the heuristic function is the key. You can give a, you can give a star a heuristic function that is going to mislead it, leading the algorithm to explore even more edges than it has to when it was just Dijkstra's algorithm. So the heuristic function is really the key. Yeah. So I have a question regarding that. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to derive Okay, so 
the first requirement, this is like a really, really ironclad you know, requirement, is that your heuristic function cannot overestimate. Yes. So that's one, okay, no matter what you do, this rule cannot be broken. Two, the heuristic uh, value cannot be negative, okay, that kind of makes sense. Okay, but other than that, okay, the heuristic function is up to you to decide in two senses, okay? One, in an algorithm like this, in an example like this, I gave you the actual heuristic function, right? You know, I just gave you the heuristic function here, and I plant specific values so that this would happen. You have to re-explore things over and over again. But in reality, you know, when you look at a map, you know, particular a map program, the heuristic function most likely is really just the straight line distance between the two points. Because one, it is guaranteed not to overestimate, and two, it is very easy to compute. So that makes the actual distance between two points on the map to be a very useful um, and practical heuristic function. Okay. So that heuristic function is not likely to lead to situations like this, because this one was specifically, in, uh, specifically designed to cause the algorithm to go like, oh, okay, that wasn't a, the, the shortest path, let's do again. You know, but when you use the um, straight line distance between two points and everything is on the uh, two-dimensional space, then you know, that, that really is a very good estimate. So does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, in the case of each vertex is representing an instruction and you're looking for the path from you know, a certain state to another certain state, and you want to go through instructions you know, to implement that, you know, remember, the, remember the compiler example that I was illustrating? So in that case, um, you, the heuristic function can be just the, the number of instructions in between. Now, instructions do not really take the same amount of time to execute, but if you just say, okay, we'll just count the number of instructions, it will still give you a reasonable estimate of you know, how much time it's gonna take for the entire sequence to finish. So there are different ways to you know, compute the heuristic you know, value. It really depends on what the vertices are representing and what the edges are representing. Mm -hmm. Cool, all right. So that means we are now ready to go back to the final exam. So let me switch back to the final exam. Oh, I just went past it. There we go. So this is the final exam, and let me see if I can maximize. I can get rid of this one. Yeah, I can maximize to a certain point, you know, but there's no way for me to maximize beyond this point, uh, simply because the um, form factor you know, is different, so that makes it a little bit harder. All right, so we are going to switch to the question that has to do with the A star algorithm. This is the Dijkstra one. We talked about this on Monday already. And there's a bunch of tray stuff, okay. And then the last one is the, uh, the A star algorithm. All right, so let's go ahead and read the question. You are given a graph, okay? So every graph is going to have a set of vertices and a set of edges. Um, S equals to A is the origin, X equals to K is the destination. So this time, you know, A is the origin or the starting point and then k is the destination where we want to end up at. In addition, that you are given you know, d of am is 31, blah, 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 so those are the distances of the edges. So part one says you know, define admissible heuristics h of ak, h of mk, h of bk, and h of kk in such a way that pref k is updated exactly once when the loop of a star algorithm runs. All right, so with this particular question, it helps to draw the picture you know, so that you can actually see it visually. Um, stylus, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna draw the graph here. So we have um, vertex A going to vertex M, and then vertex A also goes to vertex D, okay, so AM, AB, B goes to K, which is our destination. And then M goes to B, there we go. And then in terms of the distances, 
distances of the edges. This is a 31, BK is a 14, uh, MB is a 29, and AB is a 65. Okay. So I have captured you know, everything that I can you know, using the graph here. And the question is, if I want to update pref of k exactly once, you know, when the while loop of A star algorithm runs, what does that mean exactly, okay? So what would be the first thing that you do, you know, when you see this particular question or read it up to this point? So what action will you take when you get to, you know, after you read part one, how do you solve this problem? Yes. So you want to know which part of the code does the update, right? And we want to make sure that we only get there once and only once, okay? So now, okay, so let's go back to our notes and see if we can find it. Uh, okay, I'm gonna be a little bit lazy and just look for graph on the tabs. <laughs> It's a really useful plugin for me because I have so many tabs open. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So basically, I want to make sure that when I find the destination, we have found the shortest path already. Okay, so I don't want to be misled to get to the destination only to find out that this is not the best path, okay? All right, so we're gonna do some analysis you know, in terms of you know, what we can do to get this to work. But the first thing we need to do is to refer back to the algorithm and ask, when do we do the update of pref of something? This is the only place. Not counting the initialization, this is the only place. So how did we get here? We got here only because the condition is true. But what does it mean when t is less than g of n? And in this case, you know, n would be the destination. Well, that means you know, we are comparing the length of a path to whatever g of n was, and then we say, oh, we just found a shorter path. Is that okay? But we only want to do it once, which means this has to be true the first time, but then it will never be true again, okay? Which means, you know, in terms of not the mechanics of the actual algorithm, but in terms of the meaning, it means the first time we find a path to the destination, it is already the shortest path. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so now that we know these are the things that we are looking at, okay, let's go back to the question and we, then we evaluate how many paths do we have to get from A to K. So I'm gonna use this side here. We can go from A to M to B and then to K, that's one way. Or we can go from A to B to K. Those are the two paths. Does that make sense? So there are two potential paths from A to K. These are two, these are the two. And then we look at the lengths of both of two, both of those. So this one is a 31 plus a 29 plus a 14, which is, okay, I cannot do math quickly, 74, I think, okay? So this gives us a 74, and then a to b is a 65, 65 plus 14 is 79. Okay, so we know the shortest path, right? The shortest path is from a to M, to B, and then to K. We also know how the algorithm is gonna work, okay? At least initially. We are starting with vertex A because it's our starting point. There's no choice but to put M and B both in the set O. They will both be, be there because the for each loop is looking, looking at every outgoing edge of A. Okay, so there's no getting around that problem that both M and B will be in the set O. The only thing we can choose, okay, that is up to us to decide is the F value between M and B. Does that make sense? 
In other words, we want to make sure the algorithm prioritizes vertex M instead of B after the first iteration of the while loop. Is that okay? Because the second iteration of the while loop is going to look at M and B and say, okay, let's pick one to be the next um, variable C, right? If for some reason it chose B, then we'll be ruined. Because if we choose B in the second iteration of the while loop, it has no choice but to get to the destination. And it's going to be the longer path. So when it is time to choose M, then it will discover, oh, okay, now there's a shorter path. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, let, let, me, let me put this in a, in a slightly different way. In the algorithm, the way we choose which vertex in O to use, you know, to take out of the set O, has to do with the comparison of the F values. And in this case, we want the F value of M to be less than the F value of B, because we don't want to choose B in the second while loop iteration. Does that make sense? Okay, so now that means you know, we need F of M to be less than F of B. Is that good so far? Okay, but you cannot just choose any value that you want to for these two. There are constraints because first they cannot overestimate. So that means um, f of m is g of m plus the heuristic from m to k. That is f of m. Is that okay? <clears throat> Has to be less than g of b plus the heuristic from b to k. That's what it boils down to. So now the question is, what is G of M? Do I have an option of G of M? The answer is, nope. You only have one path from the start to M, so you don't have a choice. G of M is guaranteed to be 31. Is that okay? So now we can say, oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna put it all the way over here because I'm running out of space over there. So 31 plus, the heuristic from M to K has to be less than, so now we look at G of B. Do we have options about G of B? Nope, G of B is guaranteed to be 65 or infinity you know, upon initialization. So now you say this has to be less than 65 plus the heuristic from uh, B to K in this case, B to K, there we go. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. Hmm. Okay, that's you know part of you know that's some constraint here, but we have some other constraints because it cannot overestimate. Okay, so now you have to look at the actual length of the shortest path from M to K. From M to K, the length of the shortest path is you know you don't really have a choice here either. It is twenty nine plus fourteen, which is thirty no forty three. Okay, forty three. So that means we have some additional constraint here, h of m k has to be less than or equal to this time. What was it again? Uh, <laughs> 43. And for the same reason, m of b k, this one is easier, there's no addition involved, has to be less than or equal to 14. Are we doing okay so far with this? So as long as the constraints here are met, and they're okay. For, fine, they're they're a little bit more than that, okay? Because you know this has to be greater than or equal to zero, greater than or equal to zero. Okay, fine. Okay, there's that extra one, but as long as you can find these values to be like that, um, okay. This is poorly written here. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but this is B K, and then close paren, okay. But as long as these constraints are met, you're good. Are we doing okay? Yeah, go ahead. If they are equal, then you have to, 
then then you have to selectively say, okay, we're gonna we're specifically choosing this one. The Dijkstra's algorithm description, you know, the question specifically said that you know you can take into consideration of you know hand picking which one when things are equal. But for this question, it did not say that. So if it doesn't say that, then if you have a chance of um, updating the pref of k twice, then it would not be the correct answer, right? You know, it's only correct depending on what you choose when two vertices have exactly the same f value. So yeah, so we, we have to be careful about that one. Yep. All right, so we got all of these, con these constraints. H of a k can be anything, okay? As long as it is greater than or equal to zero, and less than the actual length of the short, less than or equal to the length of the shortest path, you're good to go, okay? So you can give it a range of values. But why give it a range of values when we say that would be fine? Because the question didn't say anything about maximizing the heuristic value. It is asking, uh, define admissible. Admissible is actually a word described in the text. What does that mean again? It is not overestimating. Yep. There, there's a slight difference between the fact that it has to be underestimating versus it cannot be overestimating. It can be exactly the same. Yep. Okay. So that one is easy. Um, H of KK is another one that is easy. It has to be zero. Okay. So the only thing you have to really work on are the two in between. And these constraints basically say, okay, as long as you make this happen, we're good to go. Yep. So there are many choices available. Choosing zero for both would also work. Yep. That would work too. <laughs> yep. Choosing zero would actually work in both cases because, okay. But I have to go back to you know, the explanation of why zero would work for both. Because in this case, if this is zero and that is also zero, 31 is less than 65. It's true. Okay, we're good there. Uh, zero is less than or equal to 43. It is greater than or equal to zero. Good there. Zero is less than 14, less than or equal to 14, and also greater than or equal to zero. We're good there. So for this particular case, yes, zero will work out in both cases. All right, and then the rest is really just kind of tracing it, okay? You know, well, okay, not the rest, but the next portion, okay? The next portion is just another trace, you know, which is here. I don't want to have to do this, but what do you guys want to do? Do you want me to actually trace this through? Because it's going to be about the same. Um, go come, come on in, you know, and we'll we'll try to find whether the derive is still attached. Is it this one? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, what color is it? What color is it? Right? Your... One is. Yeah. Oh, the green one, not the other one. Okay. So we we got the green one. What is the other one? What color is the other one? Hmm? Yes, you got it. <laughs> I have to ask, I'm sorry, because you know, I, do, I want to make sure I return the item to the right person. Sorry so much. There you go. Thank no you problem. Everyone. No problem. It'll be, it'll be more fun to make one red and the other one blue. Referencing you know, the matrix again. Yep. <laughs> I think one is a day quill and the other one is a night quill. In that case, the day quill has to be the one that is red, and the night quill is the one that is blue. <laughs> okay, a little bit too much for the matrix you know, references. Okay, so part two is really tracing the algorithm um, you know, through all of this stuff here. So we got A, M, B, K, and then you just have to kind of fill in the values. Yep.
But the question did not ask you to maximize. You, if you were to maximize, okay, so if you were to maximize, then AK, the H of AK, has to be the length of the shortest path. So it would be 65 plus, uh, no, the other one, this one here, which is uh, 74. So 74 would be the maximum of H of AK. And then for H of KK, it has to be zero. So it's the two ones in between that we kind of have some room to play with. So the room that we can play with is um, H of MK has to be less than or equal to 43. But when it is 43, 31 plus 43, we have to make it less than 65 plus the 14, which is here. And in that case, it works out too. So in other words, the maximum of H of MK is 43. The maximum of H of BK is in fact 14. Because in that case, the heuristic uh, gives you the best estimate, the actual length of the shortest path between the vertex and also the destination. So when your algorithm is most informed, then it's not going to explore the paths that are guaranteed not to be the shortest path. So from that sense, you know, it works out. Yep. So I'm guessing the case where you'd have to add for like up to like max or minus, it would be when the left hand side of uh, that uh, plus n of like mm -hmm. p of n, yeah, p of the number plus a heuristic. Mm -hmm. If the left hand side has the g function be greater than the g function on the right hand side. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in this one is a simple one, you yeah. know, because you know, just because um, the one with the least number of hops, you know, turns out to be the longer path, and it's you can visualize, you can just go like, okay, we just have to make sure that we don't explore this one and we pick this one instead. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so does that answer your question? Okay. Um, basically, if you are using a, the A star algorithm, and by you know using pixie dust. You can make your heuristic your value to be reflecting exactly the length of the shortest path. Then the algorithm will always make "quote unquote" the right choice. So it will always choose the correct vertex to expand, and it will find the destination in the same number of iterations of the loop as there are hops from the start to the finish. And then once you get there, it will be done. Even though you might have a bunch of stuff left in um, the set O, it will still be done because everything is exact in that case. The F value is truly reflecting you know, the actual distance of the shortest path from the start through a particular vertex to the destination. So I'm not sure. Are you guys kind of getting that? OK, all right. Excellent. Yes? Mm -hmm. So these kinds of questions you know, is here because I want to see whether you guys understand the algorithm itself, okay? Not just mechanically being able to track what I need to do next, but also to actually understand what the algorithm is doing and why it works, okay? Because that is really important, you know, when you're taking, um, you know, the classes that are basically sequels to this class at a four-year university. All right, so let's get to the last part, part three, which we did already. Generalize the constraint of how to choose the heuristic value based on the edge distances, blah, 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 blah. That's exactly what we did. Okay, let me show you what, what I mean by that. All of these inequalities is the answer to the last part of this question. And the rationale that I went through explains you know, why these inequalities exist. Hmm? The reasoning behind. Yep, exactly. Yep. All right. So with question number four, yes, go ahead. And just making sure we're um, G is the one that's uh, A and B pair because that's when you visit every single vertex and then update at the points. Say again? Uh, I'm just, uh, I got a little bit lost why we decided uh, 
um, on AMD Pay, because that's just the shortest path, and that will result in such a huge data crunch. Okay, so there are two paths, right? Yes. Two alternative paths. One uh, is AMBK, and the other one is ABK. Yes. But if we, there's no choice but to choose A in the first iteration because that's the only element in O. Exactly. But there, you don't have, you also don't have a choice that at the beginning of the second iteration, both M and B are in the set O. Because you know there are two outgoing edges from A, one is to M and one is to B. If you are to choose B to become variable C, then you would have found K already, but it is the longer path. That will force the algorithm to have to go back and you know, update oh. again. So, yeah. so you want to avoid the algorithm, you want the algorithm to avoid choosing B over M in the second iteration of the while loop, because that is going to guarantee leading to two updates of pref of K. Okay. So and just figuring out the shortest path beforehand, and then yep. like manipulating the algorithm. That is correct. Okay. Yep. Yep, go ahead. Yes, it has to be zero because the length of the shortest path from vertex k to vertex k has to be zero because you're already there. And yet the heuristic value cannot be less than zero, so your only option is exactly zero. All right, any other questions about the A star algorithm? All right, if not, we can go back to uh, one of the two earlier questions, we may not have time to finish both, so you guys get to choose which one you want to do. Do you want to do the vacation one, or do you want to do the uh, marble one? Hmm? Vacation? You all want vacation? I can understand that. <laughs> okay, so remember in the question, I modify a little bit. And you know, basically, I change this six to a five. Okay, I mean the six is a problem they can solve too, but changing it to five makes it a little bit more interesting. Okay, all right. So I'm just going to read the question a little bit here. Sam and Pat wants to they want to go to vacation together. Each person independently independently selects eight destinations from a travel guide that has a total of thirteen destinations. Sam and Pat want to go visit six of those you know, destinations. They also agree that if their selections do not overlap by at least five destinations, they would rather not go because you know, that means you know, they have significant differences in terms of you know, where they want to go. At the time of the selection, Sam and Pat agree that they can decide when to visit each destination later, which means they haven't set on the order of those things. Okay. So which kind of problem do you think this is? Okay, think about experiments. Okay, if if I look at this as an experiment, what kind of an experiment does it resemble? This is a little bit tricky. Okay, I will tell you, I, I do have to say this is a little bit tricky because you have to look at it from a certain perspective. So the trick is to look at it from the perspective of one of the two people only. In other words, you're basically going like, okay, Sam, go do your thing, okay? Sam is going to select you know, the eight destinations out of the 13 in the tour guide, right? So now you focus on Pat, and you go like, okay, Pat, um, Sam has already chosen eight destinations, and Pat, now everything rests on your shoulder because if the eight destinations that you have chosen, of which five are overlapping with what Sam has already selected, then we get to go. Yep. 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 Very good. Okay. So it is without replacement. Okay. So without replacement means you're either looking at combination or permutation. Okay, so now we, we got two options, right? We, we can be saying, okay, are we counting permutations or are we counting combinations? Which one is it? 
There's one sentence here specifically to help you choose the right one. Yep, exactly. The last one says you know they they decide when to visit each destination later, which means ordering is not important. Okay, we just need to know which ones are on your list. I don't care the order on your list. I just need to know is it on your list? Okay. So which problem does it we do you recognize? Do you recognize this is Oh, okay, so this really has the same kind of setup as that particular problem, even though it is kind of quote unquote deformed. Hmm? The lottery ticket, the, lot, the ticket, the, the lotto ticket problem, okay? So it has resemblance to the lotto ticket problem. How is it resembling? Well, in the lotto ticket you know, question, the five numbers, the five winning numbers, they are chosen by the official, right? You know, the officials you know, go like, okay, let's you know, draw your know, five balls out of the basket, and those will be the five chosen numbers. And then you go buy your lotto ticket, and you get to choose your own five numbers, right? And how much money are you going to get? Are you winning? I mean, there are varying levels of winning. So we are forgetting, we are, we are ignoring the, what is the name of the, is it called a Powerball number? Okay, so we, we totally disregard the Powerball number. We're only looking at the five winning numbers, right? So if you, you know, if five, if you choose three of the five winning numbers, you get to win a certain prize, okay? It's the same kind of question, it's the same kind of problem. So in this case, you are, the, the official are choosing eight out of 13, and then, so that's already set. We don't really even consider the number of options there, right? So what about you? What choices do you have? Okay, so let's look at Omega here. So from your perspective, okay, you are going to choose eight out of 13 destinations from the tool book. So how many ways can we do this? The question answers itself. <laughs> what did I say? We're choosing 8 out of 13. So this is basically 13 choose 8. That's the cardinality of big omega. Big omega is the set of all the possible outcomes, right? So that's that's basically what it is, okay? 13 choose 8 is representing the number of things that you can number of ways you can choose 8 out of 13. Okay, great. So the next question is, which is more important, is what is the set of the event set? The, what is the cardinality of the event set? Okay, I misspoke. Okay, so what we are interested in is you know, a certain number of overlap, right? So the question is, if you look at the choices of SAM as quote unquote the winning numbers, and then you look at the destinations that you are choosing as the numbers on the lotto, then you have the right structure to answer this question. So what is, so how do we formulate this? So you have eight, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay, so the, so let me continue with this. The question asks, um, they also agree that if their selection do not overlap by at least five destinations, then they would rather not go. So that means that's the first, that would be a good starting point. Yes? It will be eight choose five, right? The starting point, the minimum of overlap. Okay, so it will be eight choose five. This eight is referring to the eight that Sam has chosen. Of those eight, you want to overlap with five. That's where the five is coming from, okay? But this is not the entire thing because this is only accounting for five of the, the eight destinations that you're choosing. What about the other three that you have to also put on your list? Where are those coming from?
So think about there are thirteen destinations altogether, right? Sam says, "You know, I have chosen these for eight." So how many destinations have not been chosen by Sam? Five. Of those, how many do you need to fill up your list of eight? Three. That's right. Okay. So that means if I choose three, and it's a multiplication because for every way. That you overlap with five of the choices of Sam, there are five choose three ways to choose the other three options, and that's why it is a multiplication. Okay, this is not unsimilar to the lotto problem, except that one is a lot more extreme because out of the five winning numbers, you have to choose three, and then out of the sixty-four non-winning numbers, you have to choose two. Okay, it's very lopsided. This one is not nearly as lopsided, but that's only one way, right? So you have to kind of basically add blah blah blah, all the way up to, of all eight destinations, I choose the same, and then of the five destinations that Sam did not choose, I'm choosing none of them. So there are、uh, a few things in between. There, are, there should be four numbers that you should be adding. Is that making any sense? All right, so the bet the better way to do this is to say, let i be the number of overlap between Pat's and Sam's your choices. Then you can just express it as eight choose i times five choose, and then this is just eight minus i, because that's whatever is re remaining. So that would be the cardinality of e. So,、uh, so I have just answered a lot of these parts, you know, just verbally. Okay, I've only written the、uh, the formula part. So, part one, if we consider this as a discrete probability problem, what is the number of trials? The answer is there are eight trials. Okay, because we are looking at things from either Sam or Pat's perspective. We look at the other person as quote unquote a part of the setup of the experiment. Okay, so there, so you're you're to choose. Eight times out of thirteen things. Part two: What is the cardinality of the outcome of the first trial? So、um, the cardinality of the outcome of the first trial is thirteen,、uh, because you know, the entire tour book, the tour guide, all the destinations are available to you.、Uh, does the outcome of the earlier trial affect the possible outcomes of later trials? The answer is yes, because you cannot choose the same destination twice, so it is without replacement.、Um, part four is ordering important in the experiment outcome. The answer is no, it is not. Ordering is not important because we just need to know which eight of the thirteen have you chosen. I don't care about the ordering. So part four is no, ordering is not important, and then part five. Is asking based on the earlier parts, explain and express z. Okay, I'm just using a variable so they can refer to it later. The total number of ways for Sam alone to select his or her destinations. I'm also trying to be politically correct. That's why I chose Sam and Pat because it can be Samuel. It can also be Samantha, Patrick versus Patricia. Anyway. So、uh, z is going to be thirteen choose eight. Is that okay? All right. So the later the other part of the question, we're interested to find out the chances of Sam and Pat actually get to go on vacation together based on the criteria stated earlier. The trick to solve this probability is to imagine that Sam is circling his or her own destinations. In some invisible ink on the tour guide, before Pat gets to select his or her destinations, and then, you know, obviously after you know Pat you know, make the selection, then we make the invisible ink visible, and then we look for the overlap. So that's basically relate trying to relate this back to the lotto problem. In other words, we are really asking what are the chances. For Pat to select at least five, okay. You know, remember, we changed it to five 
out of eight of Pat's choosing of the eight destinations that are circled by Sam already. That is my way of hinting what I said a little bit earlier in class, okay, you know, to relate it back to the lotto problem. So part six is you know, formulate and express why. The number of ways for Pat to select exactly, okay, change that six to a five, but you know, six works too. Six of the destinations already circled by Sam in invisible ink. That would be eight choose six. Because Sam has already chosen eight, and of which you want to select six for Pat. Um, part seven, generalize and express X as the number of ways for Pat to select at least six, okay? So that's when the sigma notation comes in handy because your Pat can choose six that are overlapping, seven that are overlapping, or eight that are overlapping. They all meet the requirement of at least six. Say again? Yeah. Yeah, that's where the sigma is coming from. And then part eight is referencing answers to earlier parts, okay? So each one, each part that you need to reference, like X, Y, and Z, okay, use those variables. Um, explain and compute W, which is the probability that Sam and Pat get to go on vacation together. So that part is really just taking it's x divided by z, basically. And then earlier, we have already computed, uh, this, is, this is basically x, and this is basically z. So x divided by z is the probability. Is that okay so far? Okay. All right, so I think we have time to get started, but we won't have time to finish it. I will send you guys a video to finish this, you know, the other question, which is question two of four, but I can at least get you guys started. Consider a big bag of red and blue marbles. Specifically, there are 128 red and 63 blue. After randomly taking 23 marbles from the big bag, what are the chances that the selection ends up with 15 red marbles? Okay. So the first question is, what kind of a problem is this, okay? Is it a lotto-ish kind of problem or is it a coin flipping kind of problem? Nope. It is, yeah, it is still a lotto problem, okay? It is still a lotto problem because what you need to remember is the 128 red marbles, you, in, in addition to the color of the marble, think of each marble has a unique ID on it, okay? So you have 127 unique red marbles, and then you also have 63 unique blue marbles. Once you take a marble out of the bag, you cannot choose it again. That makes it a quote-unquote lotto-ish problem, okay? So answering the first part for 2%, if the selection of marble is considered an experiment, how many trials do we have? That's an easy one, uh, because we are choosing 23 marbles out of the entire bag, right? 23 trials. Part two, ignoring the color of the marbles and consider each marble unique among all the marbles, what is the number of outcomes for the first trial? It will be 127 plus 63, because that's the total number of marbles in the bag. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, part three, are the outcomes from earlier trials of the experiment replaced in later trials? The answer is no, because we do not put a marble back in the bag. Does the probability consider ordering of the selected marble significant? The answer is no, because we just need to do a count. I just want to know, do we end up with 15 red marbles? How the red and the blue marbles interleave, I don't care, okay? So ordering is not important. Um, uh, explain, express, and compute W, the cardinality of the outcome set of the entire experiment. What do you think that's going to look like? Okay, are we counting permutations or are we counting combinations? Combinations, very good. Uh, how many do we get to choose from? 127 plus 63, which is what? 
200, 200, no, 190. Yeah. yeah, 190. Choose what? Choose 23, okay? Because of the, the gigantic bag of marbles, we are taking 23 marbles out of it, okay? Um, and we are running out of time. Explain, express, and compute Z, which is the number of experiment outcomes that meet the probability criterion. 15 are red in a selection of 23. Okay, so how many ways can we have 15 red in a selection of 23? So this one gets a little bit tricky, okay, because you have to take the blue into consideration too. So it would be 127 choose 15 because we need 15 of the 127 red marbles times 20, uh, what is the remaining portion? Eight, right? So we have to choose eight of the 63 blue ones. And then the product of those two becomes the answer of part six. In other words, we're going through the same motion as in the previous question. So you, basically what you need to do is to identify those key flags of the requirements, okay? Are we, is it replacing or not replacing, okay? How many, you have to identify what is each trial doing? What, how many choices do we have for the first trial? And so on. Is ordering important, okay? So those are the very same thing, even though the question looks different. Um, so I'm going to stop here because there's another class coming in. I will use a video recording to finish up you know, question number two out of four, and that would be the end of all the lecture material. Unfortunately, I actually record today's lecture, so this, this is all good. <laughs> I know some people are going like, no, tech, don't tell me that you forgot to record.